morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us so so promptly and on time. Um, we're just going to give give everyone a couple of minutes um, to to get in. I know there's a lot of you joining us this morning. Uh, great to see you all. So yeah, we'll just just give everyone a couple of minutes. Um, but in the meantime, it'd be really handy if you could all rename yourselves in the participants tab with your full name and organisation, because um, that will help us put you all into breakout sessions this morning. Um, and help us know who's who exactly we've we've got in the room. So yeah, if you could all all rename yourself using the participants tab with your with your full name and organisation, that'd be really helpful. Um, and yeah, do do introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, yeah, say say who you are, where you're coming from, maybe even what the weather's like outside. Um, I know every time we do one of these sessions, everyone's really keen to point out whenever it's sunny in Yorkshire. Um, to go against the common conception so so yeah let us let us know that and as I mentioned if you could all all rename yourselves with your full names and organizations that would be that would be really helpful <coughs> great we'll just give everyone another minute to to join us um yeah, if anyone anyone who's just joined, if you could just rename yourself with your full name and organization in the, the chat there and introduce yourselves in the chat and rename yourselves in the in the participants tab. That'd be really helpful. If I could ask you all to mute yourselves while we're in the main session as well, that would be helpful just to minimize background noise. Um Mike, I think you, if you click on the participants tab, you should be able to rename yourself in there. But I can I can see you've already got your full name, so that's that's helpful at least. Um, but we will, while everyone's just joining, we'll we'll make a start. So morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Northern Power Grid Community Energy Training Session on Retrofit with Carbon Co-op. Uh, my name is Kai Hoare. I'm a project manager at Regen, working on our community and local energy program. And we're a not-for-profit centre of renewable energy expertise, working on a, a mission to transform the energy system for a net zero future. As part of that work, we've been working with, with Northern Power Grid um, over the past three years or so on their community energy work, where we've met many of you online plenty of times, but also, also in person as, as well. Um, and it's through that programme of work that we've come to, to put on this training session on retrofit this morning. A lot of you have told us that you'd, you'd like to know more, like to have a specific session on retrofit, um, which is why we're really delighted uh, to be joined by Jonathan from Carbon Co-op, who are one of the, the foremost uh, community energy organisations in the UK on a leading a pioneering approach to community-led retrofit. So really delighted to be joined to be joined by him. And I'm sure you've all got lots of questions for him that hopefully we can answer uh, throughout this morning's session. And we really want this session uh, to be as interactive as possible. So do continue to use the chat function as we go through this morning. Um, ask any questions you want to ask, introduce yourselves on that. Um, and then we, we're also going to be having a few breakouts as we're going through this morning's session. So that's that's really the chance for you to ask, ask the questions that you want to do, discuss ideas that come up through this morning with, the, with each other, and then bring those back into the main session as well. Um, we're going to be, be going slightly higher tech this morning as well. We're going to be using Menti and to get all your, your feedback and thoughts um, at, at the beginning and the end of the session this morning. Um, so if you if you could have that open, I'll, I'll have details on, on how you do that in just a minute. But yeah, it, it might be easiest if you have, have menti.com open on either a different screen or a different device. It works quite well on mobile devices um, and there's a code I'll, I'll get up on the screen in just a second. So yeah, just do be aware of that. If you can give us give us that the, your feedback um, through that, then that would that we yeah we'd really really appreciate that. Um, I think overall you know it's really we're really pleased to be doing the session this morning. It's it's a really timely session, um, to be doing doing this during Community Energy Fortnight, which is Community Energy England's sort of annual celebration of all things community energy. And this year the theme is on efficiency first and really looking at how community energy can help us um, address the, the sort of dual challenges of of the climate emergency, but also the cost of living crisis. Um, and, and the way, looking at the way in which community energy is well placed to deal uh, with, to offer trusted advice and solutions to both, both of those issues. 
um, and I'm sure Jonathan is going to going to be able to speak to uh, to plenty of that this this morning. Um, before anything else, I will run through run through our agenda for the for this morning. So hopefully you've all had a chance to uh, to see this already. Um, but we will. So we yeah, obviously got a packed packed agenda. Jonathan's just going to run through the aims of the session and what we're going to get out of it. Um, before we we go on to a, to our introduction breakout. Um, and we're gonna. We're, that's really just the chance for you all to say hello. Um, basically, talk about what you want to get out of the session and think about any questions you might have. Um, then Jonathan's going to take us, give us a bit of an introduction to retrofit and what the opportunity is uh, for community energy within that. And then we're going to have a, a second breakout session uh, for about fifteen or twenty minutes, just to draw out some of the key questions on that and think about what the opportunity is for retrofit in your <laughs> community. Then we're going to have a quick break, chance for you all to, to go get a cup of tea, stretch your legs. Um, and then when we come back, we're going to sort of get into to more, of the, more of the detail. Jonathan's going to talk us through the dynamics of the sector, uh, how you engage people in that, which I know is a particular issue that has come up many times for a lot of community energy groups. Um, and then, you know, almost most importantly, how do, how do you build a business case around this? How, how do you make it pay so that you can develop that retrofit service? Um, and then and then we've got some community energy case studies and then next steps and then that that sort of theme on next steps what how do we take what we've learned this morning and and, and build build on that that's really what we're going to be reflecting on uh, on our third breakout session um, and our feedback at the end so as i said we will be using uh menti to get all your your feedback this morning so if i could ask everyone um, to go on menti.com or scan that QR code. As I said, it works works really well on sort of mobile browser, um, or if you get it up on a, on a different screen, that has worked really well. And the code's there, um, 52895030. So if you can all, if you're all able to get onto that. I'll just give everyone a minute. Okay, so hopefully that's working for everyone. I said menti.com and then it's 52895030. And then what we're really keen to know, firstly, is who's in the room. So just let us know, you know, really briefly, how many people are in your community energy organization? So I know that I know that we can categorize that differently, whether that's volunteers, full time staff. But I suppose if we're thinking about doing a, a retrofit service or retrofit advice, how many people might you have in your organization that could offer that? Um, how, yeah, who could you develop that with? And then we, we just want to know what's your sort of experience in community energy, like how many how many years old is your organization? How long have you sort of been? Be looking at this how long yeah how long have you been in in community energy um so i'll give everyone just another minute or so to to answer that one kai is it possible to um put the menti code in chat for everybody? Uh, yeah yeah absolutely Thanks, Simon. Great. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully everyone's had a chance to uh, to answer that. Really good to see, and um, you know, a really mixed um, sort of you know range of people. A few people who is just just them in their sort of community organisation starting that on their own. Obviously, people who've got got well well developed with a with a lot of people um in their in their organization so yeah we i'm sure we you know we want this session to cater for people at, at all levels all stages the stages of this journey um and i know jonathan's going to speak a bit about that later um and yeah really interesting to see it's mainly the newer newer organizations um that are joining us today so that's that's great to see um and then the next thing we'd like to know is you can make this as broad or as specific as possible. What's your experience um, of energy efficiency or delivering energy advice work in your community or retrofit? Um, yeah, what's what's your experience of that? Of how, how much of that work have you done? Have you if you've done none of it, that's a perfectly valid answer. Um, yeah, what what type of work have you have you done um, in this in this area so far? You know, have you have you set up a, a stall? 
um, in the local shopping centre for energy advice or if, you, if you've gone and delivered energy efficiency measures, um, yeah, be as, be as broad or as specific as, as you want. Okay, so it sounds like a few people are just just starting up this. Um, yeah, prepare, preparing to offer advice soon. <clears throat> Some energy audits, tra yeah, training. So, yeah, we're re really hoping this the session this morning can you know if, for those of you that are just starting out or planning to offer advice soon, you can you can sort of get that the information that you need, and that can be a sort of useful springboard. Um, to offer offer more services, so I will just give anyone anyone who's finishing an answer just give you another minute um, just to just to get those in. Great, it's good good to see a real real mix. Um, yeah, many of you just just starting out offering offering energy efficiency work, energy advice. Um, so yeah, and hopefully those that, that haven't started that yet, this, this session can be useful um, in terms of taking that work on. And then finally, looking specifically at delivering retrofit um, in your community. How are you, how are you feeling about, about engaging in this work? Are you feeling positive about it? You know, really excited to go and deliver this work? Are you unsure exactly how that service might work? Are you apprehensive about it? Um, yeah, how, how are you uh, overall? How would you describe your, your feelings about, about engaging in retrofit delivery work? Maybe that's informed by conversation you've had in your community. Maybe you're yeah, excited. That's that's really good to hear. Um, you know, unsure that's that's absolutely fine. I think it's uh, you know, it can be can be difficult to see to see how we sort of solve this this problem. It, it does seem quite quite massive at times, but I'm sure Jonathan can can allay some of those um, uncertainties this morning. So yeah, great to see some of you feeling keen, you know, hopeful about, about doing it. Some of you having a bit, causing a bit of a headache, uh, finding it a bit tricky, a bit of a mountain to climb, which, which I agree can, you know, can definitely, definitely feel like that when you, when you start it up. So um, yeah, as I said, hopefully this, the session this morning is, is really useful in helping just unpick some of those, some of those difficulties that people have found, or if, you know, if you're all really positive and excited to go and do it, then it can, it can get you ready to go and go and start delivering that um yeah thank thank you everyone for giving us giving us those those answers uh really useful to inform us as we're going through this morning's session uh and i will now hand over to jonathan hello yeah thanks kai thanks to uh, everyone for coming uh it's a fa really fantastic turnout and fantastic to see that people are really excited and energized to think about energy efficiency um and retrofit i guess um Conversely, that's partly because it's such a such a huge issue at the moment, and there are and there are a lot of people want to do stuff um, around this. Um, let's talk briefly about the aims of the session. So, what we're going to be covering today is um, helping you get an understanding of whole house retrofit, um, a little bit of a definition of what that is, what's involved, how you might go about identifying suitable houses for retrofit. Um, how you and your organization might upskill and increase capacity, um, understanding how you might replicate aspects of what People Powered Retrofit has done. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about People Powered Retrofit as we go. Um, financing works and how people in the kind of able to pay space um, are able to do, do this sort of thing. Uh, how to engage householders and the wider community and understanding what kind of technical expertise or training community energy organizations might need to access. Um, one thing I'd say is like, this is the first time we've run this session. Um, I've based it on other previous sessions that I've done, but also the brief that Kai has given me and also <clears throat> Northern Power Grid. And so um, <clears throat> we've done our very best to try and cover as much of this as we can in the time available, just over two hours. But I would say is inevitably there will be things that we haven't answered or we haven't covered. Now we've built into this several breakout sessions, um, and the intention of those is for you to both well 
the intention is so that you're not sat in a session for two and a half hours, which I know, having done that myself, can send one to sleep quite easily. So you've got some time where you're actually talking and, and interacting with other people because you've got some great people on the call. Um, but also it's an opportunity to kind of formulate questions and reflect on, on the, the content that you've heard. So we, we totally understand that we may not have covered everything and there may be gaps and it's an opportunity for you to ask us basically and to pose those questions. Um, fundamentally also we want to improve and, and do further sessions in the future. So again, as it's the first time we've run this particular session, um, it will be it's a good opportunity for us to understand what we've missed, what we could improve, what we could do better, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so I'm just going to move on. I'll talk about a little bit about carbon carbon people powered retrofit, and then there'll be a chance for you to talk um, to other people. Um, just a little bit about my background. I'm actually originally from the northeast. I'm from Gisborough near Middlesbrough. Um, that's where I grew up. I came to Manchester to do climate science at university here. Um, after leaving university, I got involved in environmental politics and also in cooperatives and community action. Um, and I've worked in cooperatives ever, ever since I left university. Uh, Carbon Co-op uh, came about as a collaboration between myself and Urbed, who are a technical um, urban design consultancy with retrofit expertise in, in Manchester. And we started uh, many years ago now, it feels, in 2007, 2008. Um, and the idea behind Carbon Co-op was an understanding that the energy transition was in motion and happening, and we're starting to see things move in time uh, from an old kind of centralized system to the new one. And a, a feeling there of like, how could communities and people and organizations be involved in that process, um, both to kind of speed it and to trigger it, but also to benefit from it so that um, there is a way to empower uh, communities and to empower community action as part of that process. So that's the rationale behind Carbon Co-op. Um, and yeah, we've been going since 2007, 2008. And over those years, we've been developing our technical expertise, our, our competency. I'll talk as we go through the session about, I'll give some examples of some of the projects we've done that enable us to build over time. Um, I think one, one question I often get asked is like, how, do you, how would we do what you've done? And it is very much a, a stepwise process that we went through of small projects, small amounts of, of funding and money, but building over time and always looking to see how our projects could build towards towards where we got to now or, or and to go beyond that as well um carbon co-op uh, historically we've always done lots lots of retrofit projects and um and and uh, lots of things in this space but we also do energy systems innovation things like demand side response and flexibility it gets quite complicated but uh, things in the home like electric vehicle chargers and heat pumps and becoming more flexible. And also we're involved with um, uh, greater citizen advocacy, basically helping technical policymakers uh, communicate with um, people and communities and helping them communities be involved in the energy transition. Um, and just a little bit of background about where these two organizations are, well, Carbon Corp. So it, we now have 450 members in Greater Manchester and beyond. And I know maybe we have some members in the audience today and uh, a staff team of 15 now. Um, and then more recently, we've spawned People Powered Retrofit, a separate community benefit society with a specific focus on uh, delivering uh, retrofit for householders who are able to pay for those services, people that own their own homes. The work is specifically in the Greater Manchester area, with a little bit beyond that as well, um, and we other do and we do other stuff, including contractor training. People Powered Retrofit is a separate organisation, separate community benefit society. We did a community share issue last year, so we have 350 plus members. We raised half, uh, three quarters of a million pounds, um, and now People Powered Retrofit has 12 members of staff and growing as well. So, two big organisations, but we've started very small and grown stepwise over time. Okay, I think now, yes, now we have time for our breakout session. So we have some fantastic organizations in a room and we want to get you to chat to each other, um, basically to introduce yourselves, why you're here, what you're hoping to get out of it. We've got 10 minutes for this and um, just to, for the facilitators and for Kai, if we could run it till 10.30, I think that's totally fine. Um, um, yeah, 
Um, so someone needs to press a button to get us in. I hope you all found that breakout session useful uh, as, as, a, as a way to just introduce yourselves. Uh, just think through some of some of what we're going to be talking about today. And I will now hand back over to Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, it was a really interesting small uh, group session in our in our small group and a diversity of different organizations at different stages and different levels. And that's what something I wanted to reflect from the um, the survey we sent when people registered, we asked for you to rank your level of understanding of retrofit one to five and to and also give us a little bit of other information. I think one thing I would like highlight there is that we have a lot of people at one in terms of just starting out and a lot of people at, at five, four and five who kind of know a lot already. So necessarily we have quite a broad sweep of people in this in this session. So I think to temper expectations for some people some of this will go a bit over your heads we, we've tried as much as possible not to use acronyms not to not to kind of pass things over and to 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 unfold things so you can see the the thinking behind for others it might be a bit too simple it might be a kind of stuff that you know already and i know a number of people said they'd already come to sessions that we've done so there might be some familiar stuff in here so necessarily we're trying to like pitch to everyone so um but just bear that in mind okay so what we're going to do is going to talk you through um just to begin with, just a little bit of grounding in retrofit. I, I get my, my understanding is that everyone's here because they understand that retrofit is necessary and and uh, and they understand a little bit about it. So I'm not going to go too much into depth there. Um, although indeed, from our from our small group conversations, some people are really starting out, so I do understand that. I'll also sort of um, talk about a bit a bit about the opportunity of retrofit and kind of uh, who we might be working with. Um, yeah. Okay, so th this this opening slide just gives you a bit of an indication of different aspects of retrofit when we're talking about it. We're talking about householders, we're talking about uh, transforming homes, and we're talking about contractors as well, because um, really retrofit is an energy efficiency is about the people and about their homes, but also about finding the supply chain and the people to do the work um, to help help improve the homes. And historically, that's been one of the kind of barriers. What is retrofit? Well, 90% of our homes that are here today will be here in 2050. We have challenging uh, carbon reduction targets for that time period. So ipso facto, we have to improve the energy efficiency um, of, of those homes. The, the demand for heat, so the demand to power those homes, we need to reduce to enable us to meet some of those targets to reduce carbon emissions, irrespective of the fact that we're decarbonizing the electricity system, there is limitations in how much power we can generate um, cleanly and, and when we can do it. So when we talk about retrofit, retrospectively fitting uh, energy efficient improvements to an existing home. Um, so this, this encompasses a wide range of, of fabric improvements. We talk about fabric, we're talking about in the bricks and mortar and the and the windows and the, the the substance of the house so that might be wall floor roof insulation draft proofing and air tightness which is um kind of what it is what it says on the tin like reducing drafts and reducing cold uh, uh, like um sealing up uh, kind of um uh, places where 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 uh, heat is lost in in a room in a in a house uh, replacement of high performance windows and doors. We talk about triple glazing, you know, double good high quality double glazing is fine, but we might want to go to triple in some instances. Now, with this, we we absolutely recommend an upgrade to ventilation systems as well, because if you're improving a fabric, if you're reducing airflow, you want to help people breathe, um, but also toxins and poor air quality can build up and um, also. Um, um, you know, water vapor as well as we cook and breathe and and wash as well. So you need, you need to, a a process for removing those kind of that kind of humidity from the from the air. That's fabric upgrades, but we also think about systems and services, renewable heating, um, renewable uh, uh, yeah heating systems like heat pumps, renewable energy generation, electricity like solar PV systems and hot water systems and that sort of thing. Again, I'm not really this in this session. We won't be going into 
what is retrofit, what are the different aspects, what are the technical things. We're focusing on how people can act as intermediaries and providers and, and that sort of thing to enable retrofit. Um, but obviously, if, if you're new to this, there are sources of information, uh, Energy Savings Trust or the People Powered Retrofit website and other places where you can learn a bit about the technical aspects of it. And why retrofit, I, and I'm not going to really <coughs> um, um, go too too much detail, but 20% of carbon emissions emanate from the domestic sector. Um, so that's a good chunk of our carbon reduction that's required to come from, from, uh, <coughs> from domestic sources. Um, but also um, retrofitting a home, making them more energy efficient, improving the ventilation helps with health. Um, a lot of chronic health conditions are linked to um, poor air quality and, and damp homes reduce bills and you know that's a huge issue at present it can tackle fuel poverty um in in many instances people may actually use a bit more uh energy in their homes when you reduce when you reduce the demand you know so you actually might be tackling other things like health when you when you uh, do energy efficiency in the fuel poverty context the, but there's also a huge economic benefit of new skills but we, what we would advocate for was local economic development, in improving local supply chains, rather than kind of thinking about this as you know big multinationals or what have you. It's the local um, suppliers that tend to get involved in this. Um, yeah. And I wanted to uh, just, I just wanted to mark really the fact that I understand, and having been in a small group session, only underlined that that people are a diversity of different stages here yeah and what i don't want to do is to say this is right and that's wrong yeah so what what the point i'm making here is um there are some people in some groups that just aspire to advice you know they just want to give out advice on retrofit you know um what should people do what should they think about how could they go about it that sort of thing that um traditionally community energy organizations have been involved in offering advice usually around energy bill switching and very basic energy efficiency um, and that and that's fine other organizations want to go a bit further they want to get they want to advocate for other people to do work they might want to recommend or at least signpost uh, householders and, and people in their community to contractors or consultants or architects or even schemes that the council are running uh, and what have you they may also want to act as a bit of a trusted advocate you know to um, be a bit of a sense check for householders for people um, to sort of help them see the wood from the trees we do know sadly there are instances of mis-selling within solar pv industry and as as retrofit becomes more and more of a more high profile we can we can envisage a similar kind of mis-selling so acting as an advocate and a kind of um passing information um, and becoming expert is another is another role there is a third role which is actually delivering retrofit works and retrofit schemes either via funding or actually getting involved offering services contracting yeah and so there is that continuum from advice to advocacy to delivery and and we're trying to cover a bit of everything in this session carbon co-op and now people powered retrofit we've been involved in all those different stages but throughout our mission we've always focused on the delivery of retrofit and we got involved in as early in our development as we could in actually delivering retrofit works and part of we part of what we see as our role as being a bit of a vanguard to demonstrate what is possible what can be achieved and to share that information with others but what i don't want to do today is to say actually everyone needs to get involved in contracting because it's going to be it's not for everyone and and we'll talk about what's required to do that um as we go on um but what what i do think is useful is to understand the processes the construction industry and all these different things in a bit better uh, detail to enable people to either offer advice or advocacy or to get involved so yeah a bit about like the different ways people can get involved Okay, so next, um, the next uh, section is on the opportunity, and we'll do this, and we'll go to another breakout, and then a, and then a break. Um, so, quite, <laughs> it's funny actually. I, I think until recently, 
uh, often policymakers, local authorities, and even community energy groups to, uh, to date have always been very skeptical. It's like, oh, you think we need to retrofit our homes? Well, no one actually wants to do it, you know, or the biggest problem is householders. They, they never want to do it and there's no one wants to get involved. What, what we've always found since 2007, you know, and, and before that is that there are huge amounts of people that are very eager to retrofit their homes. They're actually very frustrated that they can't find a way to do that and they can't find the opportunity. So um, I'm going to sketch out what the opportunity is because because it and I, I hear it less and less from councils and other people. There is an opportunity there. So. To begin with, I would say, I would ask the question, I will answer this, but I'll ask the question is like, so we're talking in this instance as well, we're talking about the able to pay or the willing to pay. Yeah, that's people who are able to pay for works. They have the access to money and funds to do this and, and they want to pay as well. What, what I would like to really highlight is um, just because this session is talking about the able to pay, it doesn't mean we disregard people that aren't able to pay, people in fuel poverty or in low incomes. And indeed, a lot of Carbon Corp's work now, since People Powered Retrofit, is to focus on people who aren't able to pay. They may be involved in other schemes or they may be involved in other things. There's a huge question around energy justice, around the transfer of resources from those who have resources to those who don't. And we're very involved with that. So I'm not just because today we're talking about people who have money doesn't mean you know we disregard those that don't. So be able to pay. So what we will talk about is segmentation, understanding like who are these people, where do they live, who are the retrofit clients, who are the people that have money and are willing and interested to pay. And and part of the process of people powered retrofit was to look at Greater Manchester, for example, and look at those areas where people are more likely to live, who are more likely to commission this work. A fundamental kind of um, a concept here is the innovation curve, the so-called Rogers innovation curve. This curve is uh, the adoption of new technologies and services and is seen through many, many different types of technology from mobile phones to electric vehicles to all sorts of things. Now, it typifies innovators and early adopters as the first to take up a new innovation before they move on to the early majority and late majority and laggards. What, what the takeaway is here is that there are people who are super motivated and want to retrofit their homes they are the innovators, they are the early adopters because it is not a normal service. It's not something you can just pick up the phone and dial someone and say, I want a retrofit tomorrow. It's a new service. So we have early adopters and they are different from the early and late majority. Now, often people say, yeah, but we want retrofit for everyone and we want to benefit. And, and that is absolutely the case. We, we do want to target everyone, but we need to, just with every kind of technology, we need to target the early adopters first and build uh, technologies and tools and delivery things for those people before moving on to the middle ground. It's like it's it's like saying in the eighties, well, I want to build a, a mobile phone that works for everyone, you know, um, because the tools and technologies, the services, the ways of delivering that that mobile phone didn't exist at that time, and what the mid majority needs won't be here at the moment you know and and we need to accept that and understand who are the people in that in that kind of innovator and early adopter um what i would say is that we've done research on who those people are and, and from our work and and they tend to have different priorities to what is commonly accepted um the early adopters these people are more motivated by climate change and tackling carbon emissions by being more warmer and more comfortable in the home and then thinking about bills further down. Also other factors involved. So I think that again, another conception, misconception is retrofit has to be cost neutral, there has to be a payback time, there has to be, you know, money has to be paid back. Often people who are wanting to retrofit their homes, who are in this kind of, you know, early the early adopters, uh, that kind of thing, they have different priorities to those in the mid majority. They are more interested in these different values to those um, uh, who have got other things going on. That's not to say bills and money is not important. It absolutely is. And increasingly so with energy price rises. Um, absolutely. But, but there are other things going on and it's not just about, you know, cost neutral uh, um, uh, payback. 
what I often liken this to is the investment that people make in their own homes of a new kitchen, a new bathroom, loft conversion or an extension. You know, people invest in their homes for the utility, for the comfort, for all sorts of reasons, and they don't necessarily expect their new bathroom to pay back over time. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that people in this kind of sector tend to have decent amounts of money to invest in this area. So the, the, we, we've repeatedly looked at this. The people that use people powered retrofit generally uh, in the, the 45 to 50,000 pound, they have those kind of budgets available. This is important when we start to think about delivering a able to pay service. Yeah, there are the funds available, there are amounts available to fund that kind of thing. Yeah, again, you know, I think there are people here who are just interested in delivering energy advice, and that will be potentially for people with very low incomes or don't have the money. And, and those are different considerations to these, you know, um, absolutely. But in the able to pay, if we're looking to, to, to kickstart our own energy efficiency service in the able to pay, we need to be looking at these people with the bigger budgets because they can afford those kind of the fees or, or the services that we might be offering. So people can afford it and, and they will pay for it, is the message here. The final thing before the break is to think about personas. Yeah. Now, um, not everyone is the same. <laughs> you know, people have different motivations. They have different kind of things going on. Um, what, what is possible to do, and um, the number of academic institutions that do this sort of thing, it, what is possible to do is to think about different personas. We've taken this work from um, Loughborough University, who are fantastic around behavior change and motivations. Um, what we've done is to divide up uh, the people that we're working with into some of these key areas. We have climate pragmatists, climate idealists and civic minded retirees. Climate pragmatists are people who want to do stuff for the environment. They want to tackle climate change, but they know there are compromises there. They're willing to kind of do, do their bit, but to a, to a degree. Climate idealists, and we work with a lot of these people, or people that want to do as much as they possibly can to tackle climate change from uh, tackling the fabric to all the energy systems and everything that goes with it. Um, and the third one in the middle, civic minded retirees. Again, we work with a lot of these. These are people not necessarily motivated by climate change, but wanting to do the right thing, um, wanting to do the, the good for their community. And, uh, and we work with a lot of people who are in faith communities or in community and voluntary sectors. You know, so it's really important to kind of understand who the people are you're working with. And m m the whole takeaway from this section is really understand those people. It might be around getting out and talking to them. It might be doing surveys or focus groups or one-to-one -one, uh, interviews. All those things are possible, but it's really important to, you know, get out, understand the views, understand, understand, um, yeah, who, who you are and what their needs, the needs are. Okay, I think that brings us to another breakout session. Um, I think our intention is to do this for 10 minutes and to come back at 11 o'clock, uh, which is um, five minutes earlier, and then we'll go for a, a tea session. So um, yeah, if you want to trigger the breakout room. Kai, and thanks, yeah, the small group session I was in was really informative as well, and a really good di wide ranging discussion. Um, I'm gonna cover the next five minutes going to cover some of the questions. Um, we had a few things. Uh, one was around, or, or and also from the chat as well, uh, um, one of the things was around street by street retrofit, uh, which is kind of targeting a whole area and helping anyone who lives there retrofit their home, whether they're able to pay or not able to pay, which is a really great thing. It's a scheme that Carbon Corp are involved in running a similar thing here. Uh, in Manchester, and we really advocate that kind of approach. Uh, we're not going to really cover that that much here, um, but we are developing a session on that, and, and we're very happy to run one uh, for Northern Power Grid or whoever. Um, there was a discussion about, like, um, why don't we just wait for the mass majority to catch up? Um, what I would say is um, there are reasons why not everyone wants to do retrofit, and some of them are technical. Some, it's not necessarily just about not understanding it or not having the right information. Some of it's not having, we haven't got the technical delivery systems. We haven't got enough people in the, in the, 
in the country to do the work with the right training, the right expertise. Most of the technologies are there, but it's about the delivery mechanisms, finance mechanisms and that sort of thing. My experience is that these things don't just fix themselves in such a way as that everyone can suddenly they're they're available for everyone that through working through the early adopters and the social housing schemes and such that are going on with the, the systems develop the, the the capacity increases we figure things out we get better the finance comes in so it's by working through those early stage people that we reach the early majority that, that it's not really a case of just waiting for them to come the other thing i would say is that there's a lot of people expressing frustration around government, government incentives and what have you. And as a cooperative, like um, and being at Co-op Congress this weekend, I think where government can't or won't act, I think there is an imperative for cooperatives to get involved and community-based organisations and to make it happen, to drive change from the bottom up rather than waiting for government. And I don't think, personally, I don't think government have all the answers or, and, and I often found that they're interesting to hear from our experiences to apply that. So there are lots of reasons why we should get on with things now and work with people who are able to. Um, there was a thing about people in massive homes, you know, well, how can we persuade them to get involved? What I would say is when, I haven't talked about it very much, but in our mapping process, what we found was that there were people with money, not necessarily the richest, not necessarily the poorest, Richer people tend to be uh, tend to have very large homes, which are hard to retrofit. There are potentially other, you know, uh, uh, equity and justice things there, maybe about like the, the size of the homes and whether they should be in such big homes. Um, so they're harder to retrofit. They tend to be those people tend to not value uh, energy efficiency so much for different reasons. I think maybe they spend their money on different things. Maybe they don't want to retrofit their homes. Maybe they're happy to pay higher prices, for example. Um, and not wanting to typify, but sometimes people in bigger homes, uh, more wealthy, can not be the best clients to work with. They can be hard to work with. So, so, so maybe this is this thing about like working with the people who want to do first. Maybe it's a case of working with those, not necessarily the richest or the poorest, but those that have money and are interested and want to do stuff. That's just that's some thoughts there anyway. Um, price puts people off. Price puts a lot of people off. But I think as our research shows, a lot of people are happy to pay these sorts of amounts of money and are willing. Now, we talk about prices so much, but the, as, and we'll come on to talk about, but a scheme that we did with deep retrofit cost £40,000 average per property over a cohort of 12, which isn't like, it's I know it's a lot of money. I'm not saying it's not a lot of money, but it's within, it's achievable by a lot of people in the UK, probably more than the actually want to do retrofit. So whilst there will be need for finance options and all sorts, and Jay rightly in the chat pointed out around loan finance as an opportunity there, which I think is very much the case. Um, there are also a large number of people that don't need that and are able to go for it. So price does put some people off, but the, but there are enough people for us to work with in the owner occupier able to pay a space to get to get going. Um, and independent advice, that's a very interesting. Uh, what, like, is it possible to get independent advice without paying for it? Unfortunately, the government has uh, historically not funded independent energy advice, and people like Energy Savings Trust have to go out there, earn money, and uh, and raise money to do the do what was once government funded government are consulting on new energy advice so there might be an instance where energy advice will be offered um independently but it's but it's likely to be relatively high level um it can be hard to find independent advice that you don't pay for you sometimes end up with people essentially selling something and their advice comes with strings attached so um and that or, or you're looking at councils local authorities or just people uh, who are volunteers and, and that is hard to to accumulate very technical advice that people often value so yeah independent advice can be hard to find that's free of charge so yeah so okay we've covered some of those questions we'll have a, a opportunity for more questions at the end of this section what we're going to do now is going to dive into the construction industry which is often an area that uh, people in community energy or, uh, sector don't have a lot of knowledge about so and I think is really crucial for people to understand 
if they're going to get their head around um, uh, uh, retrofit and energy efficiency. So I'm going to introduce you to a series of terms just to ground you know you in some of this kind of stuff that's going on. I'm going to talk about fabric first first. Uh, naturally. Fabric first is the concept often heard within uh, energy efficiency and retrofit. And that's the idea that we invest in the fabric of a building first to reduce the demand for energy before we get onto other things like PVs and, and, um, and heating systems. Two very simple uh, examples of why that might be a be good idea. You wouldn't want to put PVs on a roof that needs re-roofing or, uh, or, or needs work doing soon because you have to take the PVs off again. You know, So better to invest in the, in the fabric of the property there or with a heat pump. Now, if you lose a lot of heat in your building, you'll need a relatively larger heat pump, which is more money more money to, to run um, uh, and potentially uh, less efficient than a smaller one. Reducing the demand for heat first means that you can uh, invest in a smaller heat pump, a more efficient heat pump. Um, and it also means that if you do the heat pump first and then you want to reduce the fabric or you want to uh, treat the fabric, the insulation later, um, you've got a heat pump that's too big and you have to take that out again. So fabric first for a lot of different reasons is, is is what we were advocating, what other people I think should have, be advocating for, making homes more comfortable, easier to heat, more healthy. There's a, there's a clear fuel poverty kind of aspect to that, as well as able to pay, protecting the building, making sure the building is going to be there in another 50 years, 100 years, however long. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and also when we think about the decarbonisation of the UK, which we talk about in our small group, um, if we have a less of a peak demand, i.e. in the, the depths of winter, we're not asking for so much heat, you know, if we can reduce that, it means there is less stress on the on the system as a whole. So fabric first is a kind of term you might hear quite a lot. It's one we'd advocate for and many others do. The second thing I'd like to introduce you to in, in this is the role of design. Yeah. And um, we have a picture here on the left. There's a there's a contractor there. Uh, contractor who carries out design work himself and on the right hand side is our lead architect at people powered retrofit marianne heaston who does the design work here a lot of people um, who are new to retrofit and new to energy efficiency don't fully conceptualize or to or, or consider the role of design within this system so um, we, we look at we look at a property we see what's needed and we say, OK, we need some insulation, we need some windows and we need a new ventilation system and what have you. And uh, oh, we need to insulate under the floors. Now, potentially people relatively new to the sector might say, OK, we just get the contractor in, we tell them what needs to be done and they just do it. Yeah. And, and indeed, if we were if we were doing simpler works, that might be might be the case. You know, perhaps if we're getting solar panels done, we'd say to the solar panel installer, there's the roof we need this many panels or we have this amount of money you know please do it and the design work the thinking about where the panels go how they orientated the size of them where the inverter goes is done by the installer so design is carried out by the the fitter there yeah and that's uh, uh, that's installer led design when it comes to retrofit there are complexities involved complexities of fitting different measures and different improvements together yeah and there are also risks involved as well which are well publicized the risks in, in energy efficiency of getting it wrong of of um, either applying it wrongly or not taking into account the existing fabric and the and details or potentially um uh you know uh, affecting ventilation in such a way as that condensation appears you know. Again, I'm not going to go into the technical aspects of, of retrofit. There are, there are other workshops and, and things we can do that. But just to say that it's, it's, a, it's widely acknowledged there are risks to retrofit. As a result, we, we advocate a degree of design work is required. You know? So we need to engage people like uh, architects, quantity surveyors, surveyors, and what have you in this kind of work. Um, so um, I think that's a consideration taken into account here. Sometimes, and in the past, government uh, and, and things like Grenfell have changed that and, and poor examples of retrofit work. 
in the in the past government has tried to reduce the the design aspect to kind of wish it away in a sense and say well we don't need to really do any design work but i think it's it's clear now to government to other people that design is required so if you're thinking about uh, running a retrofit scheme you need to not just think about supply chain in the terms of like getting the builders but also thinking about designers consultants and other people okay we thought about fabric first think about think about design <clears throat> another another key term to get a handle on here PAS 2035 which is like a horrible acronym that uh, many people I'm sure will just instantly forget um now linked to the previous point really about uh, about design there have been a number of retrofit schemes in the past that um, were were not done properly, you know, and and that's not to say that many many retrofit schemes weren't done well because they were, but there were examples, well documented examples of schemes that were done badly, and um, a widespread acknowledgement from government and from those in the sector that these have damaged. Um, the reputation of retrofit and it damaged um, householder trust in the idea of getting a retrofit done, you know, um, um, rightly so as well. In response to that, um, the sector initiated a review called Each Home Counts um, in the mid 2010s. And then more latterly, um, uh, from that review came a standard. Uh, British Standard Institute, BSI, Standard PAS 2035. The 2035 just is, there are many, many different standards for many, many different things, consumer products and all sorts. This happens to be, there's no, it's not a date um, is what I'm trying to say there. Um, and there is indeed like another retrofit standard, PAS 2030 as well. So all the more complicated. Um, you can obtain the standard and you can read it. And I would actually say for those with a little bit of technical competency, you don't have to be an architect to read it. It's actually quite readable. And um, what it does is set out the process and the framework, which is what I'm showing on the right hand side, the framework through uh, the order through which people should do retrofit schemes. Again, I'm not I'm not saying that um, that uh, community energy groups need to understand past 2035 back to front, understand all the applications of it, but uh, but an understanding of the context of it is useful, and it is under and and, and just a, a high level understanding of it is good if you're going to be navigating this kind of area, whether it be through an owner occupier retrofit scheme or through a, a council scheme or what have you. I'd also say that. Past 2035 accreditation, you know, a scheme that is accredited within this standard, um, is not is is often a requirement for publicly procured works, but doesn't necessarily need to be a requirement for works done in the owner occupier sector. I think there's a good there's a good framework. There's a lot of common sense in here. There are also some things in this which exclude. Um, organizations in the community energy sector and and uh, indeed the technical authors of past 2035 admit that as well acknowledge that so a, a good framework a good context to understand but not necessarily something to read back to front contracting is hard <laughs> I, I, I'm, i've got a couple of slides here about contractors and a, a lot of um a lot of community energy groups rightly highlight the lack of contractors as a, a limitation to delivery of energy efficiency works. Um, I think what, what I've been trying to say with these previous slides is, especially the thing around design is like, it's not just about contractors or builders, let's call them. You know, there are, there are wider skill set involved in retrofit and, and it's important to conceptualize that it's not just about builders. When we do think about builders, some, sometimes people say, oh, why, why don't you do building? Why don't you do the contracting work um, as a community and intermediary? You know, um, and my response is often because contracting is quite hard to do. My, my father was a contractor for many years in Middlesbrough, and I could tell you lots of different stories about how contracting works. But it's a very, very different business model to the kind of advice offering services to householders, helping people go through the through the system of retrofitting their homes. It's often, a, it's a cash flow heavy uh, enterprise. There's a lot of risk involved. People go bust, you know, even good contractors go bust for all sorts of different reasons. So contracting is a hard business to get into. There's also 
the idea that we are advocates for the householders, we're the householders kind of advisors. So there needs to be a bit of a, a, a step back and, a, and a, a separation of roles there between advising the householder and, and helping them find the contractor, but them working with a contractor of their choice, rather than us trying to do everything for them and being a bit of a conflict of interest. Oops, forgetting how to advance. So again, this could be a whole separate um, workshop on its own, how to engage with the supply chain. Again, the point here is there are many and various different people within that supply chain. It's not just a builder, it's, it's all the sort of um, organizations and entities that come together to help uh, retrofit a home. Uh, designers, builders, subcontractors, the suppliers behind there, the builders, merchants, but even even certification in bodies and all sorts of things. So there are lots of people involved there. Um, so um, as, as I see some discussion about past 2035. Yeah, to actually download the standard is, is expensive, but there are lots of different guides to it, lots of different workshops, things freely available there. So if you don't have the cash to buy it, then um, then there are different ways to find out what's in there. Um, okay, supply chain. Um, for me, okay, it, relationship building is really key. And we have people here from many different kind of areas, urban, rural, what have you. It's about building relationships with the contractors that work in an area and that that is likely to be people are already working in in homes uh, people are already uh, fitting kitchens and bathrooms and loft conversions and extensions these are the people likely to want to skill up to go into these areas um, i think it's important as well to understand that supply chain these are businesses as well so they you know they are Whereas I know we're motivated for all sorts of reasons and the householders themselves, but supply chain are businesses. So it's important to understand the, how they see this as a business um, and, and to ensure that there's an opportunity for them. And good information and clarity on roles is really important. Quite a lot, quite often contractors just want to be clear about the work that's intended for them to do, uh, clear around the skill sets that are required. Um, and clear on the priorities of the client as well. So that's, that's something we can do. We can help make good clients, you know. So yeah, there are many and various different ways to engage with supply chain, um, just highlighting them here. Um, but yeah, supply chain development and engaging with supply chain in your area is, is as important as that engaging with the householders as well, you know, very specific. Right, I'm gonna talk now a bit about retrofit assessments. Um, so we talk about supply chain and what have you and the different different dynamics there, different things are in the business. Retrofit assessments. Now, what, why would we assess a property? An assessment of a property generally involves someone visiting the property, an assessor, retrofit assessor, making an assessment of that <laughs> property uh, in terms of where it, what kind of state it's in at the moment, and then making some recommendations for the different things the household can do to reduce their energy demand. So the key questions we, we on this is the thing we got involved with first was like where where to start where as a householder what should I do first which measures will have the most impact if I have for example five thousand pounds or two thousand or twenty thousand what should I do first or what should I do with that money and what does my whole house plan look like I've used that as a sort of shortcut to like if I wanted to retrofit my whole property, what would it look like? Yeah. Um, there we go. So there are different types of assessments that people can do. And the assessments that you might get involved with will have a bearing on the kind of services that you might want to offer. And, and again, thinking in, you know, with our advice, uh, advocacy and delivery, it might be you're just interested in advice and you don't want to get really, really involved in the technical side of things. That's totally fine. It might be that you want to get really involved with things. So it's in, important to understand the kind of assessments you might want to offer either yourselves or via others. The starting point really is quite a general uh, household condition survey or a walkthrough survey. Um, and we've done these ourselves, like tick boxes, home energy checks, people might have done in the past, Energy Savings Trust have done those, 
um, the thermal imaging surveys where you point and click a camera. Uh, there's an organization Cheese does those, but anyone really can use, use a thermal imaging camera to do a basic condition survey of a household. These are good kind of starting points, you know, um, to engage householders. Um, what I would um, temper is that don't expect a householder to do a large amount of, of uh, fabric improvement, you know, installation on the basis of a walkthrough. It's generally the assessors will be like of lower technical competency and skill. So the assessments might be low cost or free, that's fine, but they're not going to inform huge works. EPCs, and this came from a small group, energy performance certificates. This is a little bit of a uh, wrong tool for the job, I would say. Energy performance certificates mandated by government as a way to um, benchmark where a property is on energy performance uh, stand A to G, um, uh, a framework mandated by the European Union and implemented here uh, as energy performance certificates, a very simple model, an energy, energy model where you put in some numbers, there's a model in the background, does some calculations and spits out a number cheap to do but as a result often quite inaccurate um i've seen epcs being sold as cheaply as 40 pounds you know it's a very quick um low skill kind of task often community energy groups are saying should we do should we train our assessors as, as epc assessors i would say it's a very cutthroat low it's a low value kind of uh, service and i would really really um uh, caution against going down that road because EPCs can give a different, um, a misleading sometimes understanding of energy performance, um, and it's imp it's important there. They, they they offer some recommendations in there. Again, that's kind of an automated thing, and uh, again, I would temper that, uh, temper the recommendations in an EPC. What you may be interested in, if you want to go beyond that kind of survey, basic survey walkthrough, is something like a retrofit assessment, a more more detailed home whole house retrofit. Um, uh, people powered retrofit, we do a home retrofit planner assessment, like a full full assessment that gives a full set of scenarios, things people can do. There's also something called plan PHPP, plan passive house planning package quite a mouthful, um, which is similar to something like that. You know, full SAP standard assessment procedure is the methodology that generates EPCs on a reduced version, but in a full version can be used to do these, these more expansive assessments. So um, you have a range of different things there. Again, uh, converse is true of the surveys. These are more people with more training, more expertise, more costly to employ them more but the but what comes out at the end is more detailed and can be used to then inform higher higher net higher kind of value works okay so i in that section i've kind of helped give you a little bit of a navigation into the um into the industry the construction industry understanding a few of the dynamics the idea of design things like past 2035 the understanding of assessments and where things go and contractors as well. Again, as I said, you know, necessarily this is a skip through given the breadth of what we're covering, but hopefully it gives you a bit of an understanding and a bit of a grounding and uh, areas for, for exploration. Going to talk a little bit, SAP is standard assessment procedure. Uh, yeah, sorry, one of the questions there. Engagement now we'll talk about. Engagement, how do you find those? If we think we have people in our area, how do you find them? How do you contact them? I will sort of typify this with some of the older approaches, which I feel are discredited in this area. Uh, so um, for Green Deal, <laughs> which was a failed government scheme, there was a lot of stock photography, articles in newspapers of like fake people, ministers shaking hands adverts on the back of buses this failed to gain the trust of householders the engagement of householders and despite the fact that this was a scheme aimed at the mass market it failed to achieve mass market all sorts of different reasons for that but certainly engagement was one of those the approach that we would advocate without again going far too far into the idea of marketing 
that is community-based social marketing. Okay, so community-based social marketing, and just to highlight, this isn't, doesn't mean social media can involve social media, but it, but it predominantly is social marketing is a thing in and of, of itself, pioneered within the health sector as a way to kickstart campaigns around healthy eating and anti-smoking and that sort of thing. It's ideally suited to innovative new behaviours and new norms. Um, as I said before, this isn't normal thing, you know, um, retrofit isn't something that everyone does. And it, there's, there's a challenge to kind of helping people understand what it is. Social marketing is very community based, neighbourhood scale, bottom up, and it's using peers and trusted institutions to deliver messages. Um, and it's fundamentally about communicating values and shared values. Um, I think it resonates really well with community energy because a lot of what we do is social marketing. It is um, communicating these broader messages, awareness raising, working with trusted councils, local uh, libraries and community organizations to create a shared message and a coherent one. Using this kind of approach bottom up means that we can create strong messages at a local level that then we can use to, to, to direct people into these kind of services that we might be doing, whether it be energy advice or actual delivery, advocacy or delivery. This is a, just a very brief example of a community-based social marketing campaign in an area of South Manchester. Um, we ran sessions over a number of uh, months here, uh, sessions in the local community sector, engaging energy parties, using uh, thermal imaging cameras in homes, but like communal events, community events, getting people involved, using a coherent kind of messaging and, and advertising. Community champions are a fantastic way to engage because it's the community champions who are your advocates, you know, understand this message and get on board, but are also able to engage with local people in their area in whatever way is most effective, rather than you sit coming along and saying, I think we need 20,000 leaflets that just that get wasted. It's much, much more effective to harness word of mouth in doing that. So yes, that's my that's my pitch for engagement around social marketing, bottom up approach, shared values, and I think it resonates very well with with our approach. It's also a lot more cost effective than than wasteful kind of marketing and and printing and what have you. Okay, so we've done we've done a bit of the scene setting, a bit of the um, a bit a bit of the context. Now I'm going to talk about how a able to pay delivery service might add up. You know, we're not so much talking about advocacy and uh, and advice, although I will kind of typify some kind of approaches as we go through. The fundamental thing to think about here is what is blocking householders from retrofitting their homes, and um, to answer that question, we spent quite a lot of time talking to them in all sorts of different ways. What we found um, talking to them um, was a number of things there that people tend to be overwhelmed by the complexity and the technical detail involved in retrofitting a home. You know, even talking about it now and people are relatively, you know, aware of this stuff, it's, it's daunting, you know. There's difficulty in making key decisions as, as they progress, you know, and a kind of wariness, like, am I doing the right thing? People are concerned about risks. They don't want to get it wrong. So they tend to, rather than like um, say, oh, I'm not sure about this external wall installation, rather than spending £12,000 on their home, they're likely just to stop, you know, and a lot of people stop along the way blocking. They might be confused by conflicting advice. The retrofit sector is a relatively small one. They hear different things. They hear people who might have very, very specific um, kind of um, approaches and, and they get confused. They don't have that independent, trusted kind of, oh, you know, advice to help uh, do that. There's also problems finding contractors, as, we, as we've said, and problems ensuring high quality works, uh, that, that quality assurance. So these are things that are blocking people. What do people ask for when they want a service? Again, this is based on a lot of research, a lot of talking to people. They ask for a complete retrofit design service, a kind of a single golden thread through that they can move through a service so they can get some advice they can do an assessment they can find the designer they can do the works and they can ensure they're high quality 
someone like a retrofit advisor, someone with knowledge and independent knowledge who's able to advise them, offer them kind of a guidance. An assessment, as we talked about, with an overview of the whole measures involved, so they get a good understanding what to do, what to do first, and a detailed design advice service again, so they ensure that good quality works. Um, people also ask for technical advisors, a lot of underestimation about how much there is involved, like structural engineers, thermal imaging, damp, cavity, air pressure, all these kind of things that go into like a scheme, you know, um, certainly a delivery scheme. And looking for the procurement of contractors, how, how can they find them? Uh, through the through the supply chain networks and on-site QA frameworks, so um, quality assurance that can happen, and they can they have it like that assurance that the work is done well. So those are the things people are after. Now, I think this slide is almost like fundamental to the whole workshop. Yeah, about in terms of um, value proposition. Okay, and this is about where you aspire your work in this area to fit within this continuum of um, advocate advice practitioner um, and and i was slightly ordered it slightly differently here but um what i'm trying to communicate with this is that um what's the value that you're offering to householders and how are they able to access that and and how are they able to and how do they value that service and and the very overall picture here is that um advocating for a third party um, is, is simpler to do for a community energy organization. There's lower entry barriers to that, but there's also lower value there in terms of value to be realized. And that a practitioner, well, it's like a delivery organization, th there's higher barriers to entry. There's more work needed to access that, but there are higher kind of impacts, but also higher kind of values to that as well. And it's in really, really important, super important as an organization, you have a, a shared vision in terms of where you want to you see yourselves here. So an advocate, you might you might recommend third parties, you know, so that the relatively little skill in, in training required to do that. Um, there might be some you know, uh, uh, training that you might access, but you, you're unlikely to be able to generate fees. It might be that you recommend someone and they give you a finder's fee. Um, you know, that's a way some people act that, you know, there's questions about independence then. You don't need a huge organization, huge amount of chain to do that. With advice, offering advice still has some level of competency. You need to, you need to, you know, go into homes, offer advice, basic stuff. So the amount of skills, training capacity needed to do that is less, definitely. You don't need like to be that designer or to have that past 2035 knowledge in full. But the ability to generate income is then limited. There are grants available there that you can access again, but not huge. The grants aren't massively generous, you know, so it's about being appropriate there. The practitioner is, is getting involved, delivering assessments, being able to deliver perhaps design advice and perhaps like um, that, that full service. There's a lot more skills and expertise required for that kind of thing and a high level organizational capacity insurance you know all sorts of things are required high level of risk involved as well but a higher impact so value proposition where you see yourselves playing a role here and and again no there's no judgment uh, we're a small organization we don't think we can do this sort of stuff but i know from discussions and looking at the attendee list there are a number of people uh, quite a large number of people that aspire to this practitioner delivery role um so that's that's an important thing to kind of acknowledge and to move with okay so yeah that's that that's that kind of area looking at making it here how does it work um what we're going to move on to for the last 10 minutes is looking at some uh, case studies. Um, now, these case studies all relate to Carbon Co-op. There are obviously other case studies out there and other organizations doing really good stuff. But what I wanted to do was just to typify three kind of ways in which Carbon Co-op and then People Power Retrofit have um, participated in this sector to kind of demonstrate what might be possible and what what organizations might aspire to and i think again it is important in kind of having that vision of where we see ourselves fitting 
Um, home Retrofit Planner is a tool that we've developed ourselves and um, it is an assessment methodology, a tool and a service that we that we offer to people. And how we got involved with this was that um, 10 years ago now, actually 2012, um, there was some government money from the Department of Energy and Climate Change to deliver um, local energy projects. We accessed that and we we knew at the time the households really wanted to know where do I start first? What do I do first? What what kind of impacts am I going to have? And so we developed this um, tool, very simple at first. It was a spreadsheet based on SAP, the government's methodology. And we started to deliver it and we tested it out. And over the last 10 years, we've delivered to hundreds of people. And this has become an income generator for ourselves. So um, it's a great way to get people, householders, on that journey. This gives them so it baselines their energy use. It gives them a set of scenarios, measures, a set of measures. So each scenario is a number of different measures, costed measures, specific, and, and information about the impact, and information about demand as well in terms of the the energy reduction demand uh, as well. It's a great way to enable people to get started, but a great way as a community energy organization to kind of start generating income. And I really would advocate kind of um, an assessment service as a good kind of starting point, maybe after advice and what have you, um, if you're engaging in it as a practitioner. I would say, um, yeah, we, we've developed our own assessment methodology and we now um, share that with other organizations and they use that to deliver stuff but there's nothing to stop you de developing your own methodology or using other people that, that offer these kind of things as well so that's home retrofit planner community green deal um this this was a um a construction project that we got involved with that we led um 2013 to 2015 and it was government a government funded scheme in the sense of they gave us the money to set this up but um the scheme itself was delivered by us and it was deep retrofit in owner occupier context so we were we were actually contracting contract uh, contractor to deliver this work on behalf of 12 householders in it, of our members we commissioned the design work from our partners at urbed um, the government funding enabled us to issue 0% interest loans to householders, and they then used that money to fund the works plus some of their own money as well. So the actual, the actual works were funded by householders rather than kind of free, free for the householder. And this was a fantastic way for us to get involved in the construction industry, to learn lots, um, to work with householders to understand their expectations and how to manage those and to get very technically involved in the whole system. So um, uh, this was quite an ambitious project. Average work costs of £40,000, big impact, you know, £1,000 a year, energy bill savings, 50% space heating demand reductions. So, really, you know, really good impact, uh, but very ambitious. I'm not suggesting everyone needs to get involved in these big, big schemes, but getting involved in a um, construction scheme is a really good way to better understand the sector and to participate in it as well. Finally, we have People Powered Retrofit. Um, People Powered Retrofit, um, initially there was a government uh, scheme to run some pilots of um, community-based uh, retrofit market delivery and we were one of the six that got money this ran for uh, two two and a half years um, in greater manchester and we we ran it as a pilot project on behalf of carbon co-op and, and urbed and it is now an independent organization on its own and working independently the idea with this was that today the householders um had um, the households we worked with, we were doing the assessment methodology. They got so far with that, but often they've got stuck at assessment stage. And we looked at ways to develop beyond assessment stage and how, how could people meet some of those kind of challenges that, that I talked about, some of the barriers that they faced. And it's now, as of last year, an independent organization. We have a, a service that we run through. And I think for those more ambitious organizations that want to be delivering retrofit, it's important to, to think about your service, the different aspects, that, the different stages through which householders progress. Thinking about advice, moving on to an assessment, 
developing design, procuring contractors, and we help people procure contractors, you know, from themselves rather than us doing the work, on-site support and coordination and handover, and all the things that go around that. This is a very simple diagram, but behind it, there's a lot of complexity. And there are a lot of different roles involved with this. There are, um, we have a technical lead, Marianne uh, mentioned, and I do business development, but we have retrofit advisors and customer experience developers, service designers, product managers, training managers. We also have software developers on the team. We have retrofit surveyors or coordinators, some sometimes people know them as retrofit assessors. Then we have designers and architects, engineers, contractors. We have architectural expertise on the staff, but we also outsource those as well. Obviously, the contractors and the engineers, they outsource as well. So how do you make it pay? <laughs> uh, again, this is a very simple kind of diagram, but there's a lot of complexity beyond this. But essentially, if, you, uh, if we go back a slide or two, you'll see these different stages. We're moving people through. At every stage, we're making a charge. We don't charge for advice. Advice is free, and we, we talk to a lot of people, um, and, and there's no obligation for them to then commission our services. Uh, and I think there is that thing about independent advice, as much as possible. But for then people who progress, we charge, basically. An assessment is between 500 and 1,000 pounds. We tend to uh, and charge as people progress at every stage, you know. Um, we tend to charge between 10 and 20% of a total value of people's works. So if it's uh, £40,000, I think it's around um, £3,000 that we charge as it accumulates at every stage. Yeah. And, um, and this, you know, in very broad terms, is the way our business plan works. That each stage, we have a different person delivering an aspect. They take a number of hours to do that. There's a cost in terms of their time to the organization. And that, that cost is what the fee that we charge the householder at the end. And that fee, those fees accumulate at each stage. Um, yeah. So I think that if you're thinking about how do we, how can we develop this kind of service where we, uh, it's about thinking about those different stages and how we accumulate. What I'd say is that we've done to do our community share issue, we had to devise quite an extensive business plan. There's a 90-page business plan that you can download from the Carbon Court website or the FX website that we used. And uh, yeah, I would, I, would, uh, I would suggest going and checking that out. Okay, so these are my last, last few slides before we go into a breakout and then back for more extensive Q&A um, running towards half 12. So make sure I cover a lot of people's feedback and questions. So how do we take it from here? Okay, so quite often uh, through through this discussion, we've had people saying these are the barriers. You know, these are barriers that we face, and I, I'm going to just highlight some barriers and some solutions. Clients often get stuck. Yeah, they often like get so far and they're stuck. You know, and um, you know as we were doing with our assessments, they get stuck at the assessments. What's it? Service design is required to have make sure there is a pathway for householders to follow capacity it might be that we don't have the, the right the right number of people to do the assessments to do the contracting to do the design an engagement with the supply chain is super important you know um, at an earlier stage as possible engage with designers assessors or training providers as well in your area income generation like how do we make this pay this doesn't pay we need grant funding and often grant funding is required to get some starting it's about the value proposition. What value are you offering? If this is a, it's if a fee earning service, you need to charge for that, you need to generate value. In terms of scaling, how do you go from small to bigger business planning? Thinking about how these different things match together, how their different income streams work. Okay, some advice, if I could, if I could be so bold, as to offer some advice to people here today. Okay, I think it's about if you're thinking about a practitioner, a delivery service, build in the trust from the start, make sure that people uh, trust the advice that you're giving them and that they can trust it, not for profit status or, or community based is, is a way to do that. Really keep client focus. 
too often in this sector we think about things that have to be done we have to retrofit all the houses we have to do everyone in this community think about the people that are doing it think about uh, who who what their priorities are and don't try and do everything all at once mapping and research is key to that again talking to people being iterative flexible in the development you know you can come up with a plan and it'll change you know think about all the ways it needs to change over time building in technical expertise so that there is capacity there and again it's about value um, think about in-house technical expertise rather than external because you're outsourcing the value there and as a community organization you're not able to grow there to deliver to to build capacity and meet demand testing and piloting starting small but starting you know if there's advice that you can be doing training you can access a small scale service start it and start trading as soon as possible um, start generating income in whatever way is possible if you're going down this route of social enterprise route and be collaborative and open there are so many organizations here on the call today in the area that want to do this kind of thing there's there's no sense in like narrowing down being open being collaborative is the key really so final thing questions to ask yourself if you're setting up this who who are your customers what do they want what are they willing to pay for what's your value proposition where do you sit on that continuum from like you know simple advice to more complex what does your blueprint look like in terms of the service you know the stages where are people getting stuck where are the gaps what does your team look like which skills do you have which are missing which you need to access and how does this add up into a viable sustainable service in the long term and it might be that you can access grant funding to begin with but the grant funding isn't always there so we'll break into breakouts now and then come up with some questions but more sources of information and advice carbon corp we do training for contractors as well as household householders and mentoring uh, for groups who are going through this process and uh, and replicating stuff that we do the AECB, Association of Environmentally Conscious Building, is a fantastic resource for technical aspects of Retrovet, and there are good links to other organisations. Community Energy England have a lot of support around for community energy groups interested in community uh, Retrovet. There are lots of webinars and training out there. Carbon Corp YouTube is full of them on all sorts of different aspects of this. And Northern Power Grid are here to offer more, um, uh, potentially for, uh, more resourcing for community groups in the Northern Power Grid area. Yeah. Okay, so that was a lot of information in that second session. We now have a breakout session to reflect on the session, reflect on the lessons learned. And um, if we could do yeah. this for 10 minutes again, Kai, is that possible? Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. Minutes we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll do these for 10 minutes and then come back into the room. At, um, at, at, yeah, Emma will bring us back into the room at 10 past 12. And then I think obviously there's been a lot of questions asked in the um, in the chat there as well. I think if if you could all just pick up on, on some of those in the breakouts as well, and then I'll just get the, each of the facilitators to sort of summarise two or three key questions um, when we when we um, when we come back into the main room but yeah do start thinking about some of the questions that are on the screen there about sort of lesson key lessons learned anything else you want to hear about um, and questions so yeah we'll go back into breakouts for, for 10 minutes now great hi again everyone i hope you um yeah hope you all made the most of our final breakout session of the of the day um spoke about you know anything that, that you'd like to know more of key lessons that you've, that you've learned um or any any questions that were that were raised um I think I think probably the the thing that that'd be most most useful to do is just pick up on a few of those a few of those questions. So I'll I'll go around each of the uh, each of the facilitators, and if you could all just you know summarize in you know really briefly sort of three key questions um, that came up in your in your session, and, and Jonathan or others might be able to pick up on those. Um, so Prina, I can see you nodding. I'll I'll pick on you first. Thanks, Kai. Um, so there's two main things that came out from our breakout session. Um, so the first was um, concerns about the supply chain and who's going to be doing the work. So that's one of the key bottlenecks that people are finding. Um, so I guess, do we need to work with local colleges? Um, what is the solution around that? Um, and the second question was around the role of local authorities. Um, are there examples of local authorities um, who are doing 
um, like good work in this and supporting is it the role of local authorities or community energy organizations and just generally um, are they well placed so that was the two main points for mine cool do you want me to talk to those kai uh, yeah yeah if you if you could join yeah yeah i think supply chain is a whole that's as i said it's a whole uh, kind of discussion in of itself um one thing one thing i think is important is to understand what the supply chain looks like with regards to retrofit and um it can seem kind of all encompassing and really really scary but actually there are already organizations already businesses working in people's homes with good technical competency who are focused on doing a good job for householders and who are eager to access um high value uh, kind of services uh, that they can offer to householders they want to help householders so we don't need to think of that as like a huge huge challenge we just need to go out and engage with people in our area that are already doing stuff and interested in this and there's lots of ways you can do that um but but one of them is just picking up the phone running a meeting running a networking session engaging with listening to the contractors needs what are they interested what's their barriers i think there are um, advantages of working with colleges but there are also disadvantages local colleges work in certain ways with their with people in their area they can sometimes be inflexible but they can also have absolutely fantastic kind of um, um, facilities and expertise and that sort of thing there are ways to run your own training stuff as well you know um, that might work specifically for for the right kind of supply chain and again think broader than just people on the tools trades because there are uh, architects out there consultants and they have links to supply chain as well that they work with already again they're already working in this area so think broadly and engage and talk local authorities role is interesting i think um i think potentially is a great link up between local authorities and community energy organizations grassroots organizations there is an enabling role there we talked in our session about how a ten thousand pound grant to carbon corp made a huge impact in the work that we could do and helped us scale up over time so it's not about like spending loads it can be that local authorities don't necessarily give us the respect that we um, should have and see us merely as conduits for communication and for information. I think it's important for local authorities to see community energy organizations as potential partners and think about how we can grow together. I think on the other side, like the, the flexibility, the engagement, the, the passion and commitment that community energy organizations demonstrate within their membership within them their organizations offer great something great and unique to councils and councils offer a, a scale and a scope that community energy organizations often lack also the membership of community energy organizations offers a window into the future in terms of they're those early adopters those people that are going to be the first in line and acting as trusted intermediaries again offers a great kind of channel so i think there are different ways to do that um, to work with local authorities and there are lots of good ways to do it yeah great thanks thanks jonathan yeah that's that's really useful um hazel how about how about in your group were there any similar questions to that or, or different ones um it's slightly different um a couple of people just feeling very kind of overwhelmed the, right at the start of the journey and so um kind of need more of that kind of uh, what where do we start is it worth getting someone trained up in the in the group um what's the kind of first step um and then just talking about grants the fact that the rcf grants not available anymore is are there other sources of grant funding um, and then finally what's available through um calm co-op so have you got kind of printed materials um and is there a way to uh, uh, kind of learn more about your tools etc yes some good ones there and i do appreciate that a lot of the i mean it came up in our sessions like oh people part actually you've done so much this is very overwhelming and this is like um how could we possibly you know and it's so much you know one thing i would say is don't forget <laughs> that carbon co-op and we we had that earlier about how new organizations are and where they're where they're starting at carbon co-op we started in 2017 and like for many years there was 
what you know no members of staff one member of staff you know um, and then we've grown stepwise over time so um, I think the important thing is like having a vision you know of where we're wanting to go so that um, all the things that as a group that you do you're building towards the kind of thing and again it might be that your vision isn't to do people part of and that's totally fine as well um, but yeah having a vision and having a cohesive vision is, is a good thing um, there is a dearth of training out there it could people saying oh like oh we start with some training there is um there is a city and guilds in energy advice um which is kind of a good way and a number of people may have accessed that as well kind of a good way to get started um there are dea um like epc training but i'd say a lot of the assessor training is not great you know in lots of different ways it doesn't teach some of the wider kind of principles and context we're big advocates of the aecb training carbon light retrofit training which offers a broad base of learning around retrofit and the principles there um and, and, and good quality and things like the center for alternative technology do great masters again that's a bit of a commitment obviously and a cost as well but there are little bits of training little bit of things you can access to kind of build your way through this i would also advocate kind of working in partnership with organizations that might have that technical expertise but thinking about how you can access it and grow as an organization we do carbon corp do do some training and have a look at our website for the training we have up there or we also have like um our youtube with as recorded lots of webinars funding rsf is a bit of a blow i know for a lot of organizations there are other funding organizations out there that you can keep an eye on i could be uh, kai can correct me but i think regen uh communities list does like outlines different funding streams community energy england is a fantastic um uh, newsletter which has those funding streams that are on there so there are others to access and and as i say i when i kind of offer advice to groups i often say think about just accessing ten thousand pounds or five thousand pounds to get things started to test things out to start kind of start that journey so i don't think you need to be like after millions and again thinking about people part of it, you don't have to be like from zero to 100 miles an hour think about like the journey and and the different points along the journey you know and um, things like the lottery awards for all ten thousand pounds you can do a, a relatively simple program of energy advice maybe some assessments maybe some information events some con contractor engagement and you know just starting on that that kind of thing uh carbon co-op um we do we've got a report section reports and publications on our website um we also have our youtube that's got loads and loads of resources on it as well um what we don't offer is kind of like uh, oh uh, as people powered retrofit we replicate our assessment methodology and our training as well but i have to you know you have to be clear that it's like again it's about capacity and training you know it's not from zero to 100 in one go so we offer lots of resources and we also work with other organizations to replicate what we're doing um but what we generally say is like gain a little bit of experience and then come to us build a little bit of capacity and come you know and come and work with us um so yeah and the people powered retrofit website uh, which is retrofit.coop is a is a great um source of more detailed information on the different stages of retrofit the different there are some templates you can download like a project brief and that sort of thing so yeah hopefully there is some some more stuff there i'm just going to quickly oh sorry this is a good time to just um say that northern power grid currently have um, a community energy fund where we're giving um five to ten um up to ten thousand pounds um for kind of all stages of um, community energy organizations. So just what Jonathan was saying, that if you want to start up and get some training, um, that's one way you could use that fund. Um, and so I'm just going to put the link in the chat to the document with the guidance for it. Um, and you can then see if that would fit um, for your organization. So, and if you have any more questions, please do email me directly as well. Right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Preen. I think, uh, yeah, it's a really good good point. As as Jonathan said, you know, you can get get some really good programs started with between you know between five and ten thousand pounds, and that's that's the idea with this 
Northern Power Grid um, Community Energy Fund at the moment. So do do get in touch with Prina if you've got any questions about that and, and check out that um, that link as well for a, for a source of funding. And yeah, thanks, Jonathan, for the plug for the Regen Community Energy Newsletter as well, where we do George does do a great job of summarising the funding that's that's out there. So if you want to, if you're not receiving that at the moment and you want to, um, then do get in touch with George, um, and I'll, I'll yeah I'll send around all that information after um, after the session as well. Um, so yeah, just quickly, George, did, were there any other questions in your breakout that we haven't haven't covered so far um, that might have might have come up? Yeah, there was there was a couple, um, and and. The one one particularly interesting one was um, where does the private rented sector fit in? And that question came from both the renters' perspective and from the landlords' perspective. So how can each party sort of get involved in, in people power retrofit sort of model? And um, another question we had was, um, is there any way of overcoming the disruption that comes from um, retrofitting? So um, the, the idea that that's a, a barrier for lots of people and um, is there a possibility to do it when people first move in, do it by a room by room approach, or, or just do it and get it done extremely quickly to minimize that disruption? Yeah, so there's two good questions. Um, private rental, God, it's it's really tricky. And I think, um, and, and a really big uh, problem that the UK faces. And I think there are, there are many and various different solutions to it. Um, I think there is, and we haven't really talked about it, um, but there's a there's a an intermediary type of retrofit um, offer that you can that you could viably deliver and develop and deliver, which is around like small improvements um, and basic improvements and upgrades um, that is focused on eliminating some of the air tightness, some of the drafts and gaps and what have you um around doors and and in in different bits of the house now we worked with plymouth en energy community a while back and they did a really great and it was it was funded i have to say but it was a really great scheme where they um were able to offer a two-hour visit from two assessors um they would go into a home and do the walk a walk through uh, survey so just a basic in inspection of the property and that we developed a checklist for them where they could just check you know uh, curtains or floorboards or loft hatch this sort of thing and 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 really just do it to fill it in uh, well we actually developed a, an ipad version so we could like a very simple list of things that you could look at in your home you know then they, that would take about half an hour they then had about an hour and a half to do as many of the upgrades as they could and they took you know all those kind of like diy b and q kind of stuff like stuff around doors and what have you and they just and um and uh you know uh expanding from what have you and they just went around and did as much as possible yeah and th that that kind of upgrade can be done in low-income areas you know or in able to pay areas and is relatively um, minimal kind of skill requirement from a from the assessor you know but it's a valuable service and it can make the difference around like um the people's perception of cold of of drafting whatever it can make some basic improvements that's the kind of service that can be offered in a in a private rental context where potentially you're talking to the tenants rather than the landlords and it's stuff that they can they can fund the real real problems around how um how benefits are shared from retrofit essentially in a private context because the landowner the landlord essentially is paying for them but the bills are paid for by the householder so the, there's almost like for the tenant so there's almost like an inbuilt disincentive for people to for landlords to act really they have to do it because they want to you know there are potentially ways you can build in service charges and what have you and wrap around bills but there are risks with those as well really really fundamentally um, there are me's minimum energy efficiency standards is a law around private rental you know that they have to achieve a certain level it's not it's not properly policed and implemented and that's around um, councils not having the resources to do that and government not sending a signal not the sticks and there aren't the incentives then for landlords so there are some things awareness advice basic measures that can be done in private rental and others but yeah it's a it's a very big challenge you know 
In terms of disruption, you rightly highlight that. Um, I was looking back at uh, an evaluation we did recent uh, we did of a of the scheme. And, you know, I think one of the things that kind of surprises people the most about retrofit is the level of disruption. If they're having internal wall insulations, literally they're having all the plaster hacked off one of their internal walls. If they're having new windows, like the whole window has to be hacked out, you know, there's dust, there's men and, and women and, peop and people in their house, you know. Uh, um, if they're doing it at a cold time of year, you know, there's, it's, they're exposed to the elements, you know, and, um, and they can, and it can feel quite disruptive. It's your home, it's your safe space, you know, so yeah, I think, I think the stuff there, I mean, um, I think the first thing is to make people aware of that. And my dad, when he worked in construction was always like tell people it's going to be really, really awful. And when it's not quite as bad as that, then they, they're good tell the people it's going to be fine and it's not then they're really angry um the second thing is um offering uh people like the ability to move out you know for short periods of time if that's possible and especially if it's an area-based scheme there might be ways in which you can enable that to happen but um i think what we found was from our experience is that short periods of a week or so you know rather than like six months you know are, are kind of have a, a small for a small outlay have a big impact you know yeah great thanks thanks jonathan yeah i think that's really really good advice um i think from our from our breakout session some similar themes to, to what's already been covered so just the idea of you know where can we find the centralized resources on, on funding and um i think just that impartial information as well people talking you know i know you've spoken about carbon co-ops youtube channel which is really useful is there anything else out there you know for households contractors community organizations um, where can we share the lessons learned? So obviously we do forums like this, but is there a more sort of ongoing resource where those lessons can be learned amongst community organisations? Um, and I think a key one was that that recommended level of advice. So there's different costs for things that will always brand themselves as retrofit assessments. So what's the right level to, to go for uh, within that in terms of, yeah, in terms of value for the amount of money someone has? Um, and then another, another interesting point is the, um, does the retrofit industry brand itself correctly? Can that be a bit of a confusing term for people? Um, you know, you can retrofit all sorts of things, but does that really put across the sort of work we're, we're, uh, we're yeah, we're, we're getting into here? Um, and just before you answer those, Jonathan, I will just encourage everyone to head back to Menti um, and just start giving us feedback in these final few minutes as we wrap up. And I'll just put that back on the screen now. Yeah, we're just coming to time now. The retrofit things are good. I mean, I think... It's a new thing and that not many people do. And there's a new term for it. And I think it's fine to be using these terms, eco refurbishment, retrofit, what have you. Um, I think communication is the right, is the best thing to um, talk to people about what's involved, what the benefits are, how people might benefit and get involved with that sort of thing. So personally, we don't shy away from the term retrofit. And I don't, uh, you know, electric vehicle evs you know a few years ago who knew what that was and through repeated use people understand it you know and that will happen and it will change but 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 also feel i think the key thing is people can understand what you're talking about because um, if you use quite obscure terms then it's like what what is that eco green housing what <laughs> you know so yeah um and yeah in terms of sharing expertise like organizations like regen northern power grid uh, community energy england you know, join our mailing list, Carbon Corps mailing list from our um, front page. Um, but yeah, um, I think there. I think we're at the tip of something here. They, we're at the tip of like an expanding sector. People want to do this within community energy, and I think um, new um, support organisations and support facilities are already and will emerge. So yeah, keep an eye out. I'd say. Great, thanks, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's a really, really good point on sort of yeah how the sector brands itself and, and puts that across. And when it's a new thing, I think there will always be be some confusion on that. Um, but yeah, as as we said, uh, we we are getting towards towards time now. So we're really keen to get your your feedback um, on this session. Understand, you know, how you we ask you when you signed up, how you'd rate your understanding of household retrofit. We really want to know where that stands now, to to so we can see just how what sort of difference that's, that's made to your, to your interest. 
um, whether we we want to put on a similar session to this again, whether there's some some more, you know, as as Jonathan's mentioned, there's you know there's a lot of topics within this that you could spend an entire sort of training session webinar going through. Whether that's that's necessary and and different ways. Um, and the, yeah, the previous question, what you're going to do in your community as a result of this, is a really key one that we that we'd like to know as well. Um, so yeah, we've we've had this session, but what what are you going going to do next? Um, and then as I, as I mentioned earlier on, um, we do, we do that we've we've ended up doing this session as as a result of feedback that we've had from all of you um, that have been to previous events on what you'd like to hear about. So do um, I think that's that's the last question we've got. So do do let us know that, um, and we always like to get your your feedback on on how you how you found the session. Um, so we know yeah we can we can design these sorts of sessions to to suit you. Um, we like to know how you how you found it, whether there's anything different you'd like us to to bring um, to the session, um, and yeah, what you what you what you want to know next time is a is a key key thing for us. Um, but while while you're filling that out, um, you know we we've we've run this program of work with with Northern Power Grids. We've got a few of them on the call. I know we've mentioned the the funds already, but uh, Helen, I just wanted to give give you a chance if there was there was anything that you wanted to touch on just before we finish. Um, yeah, thanks, um, Kai, and thanks for everybody's contributions. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I think um, from the amount of discussion and questions and people's life cycle in this area, we would be really interested in um, talking to, to, um, to Carbon Co-op about a further session if people would be interested in this particular area, maybe going into some of the, the case studies in more detail. Um, and also having a look at, you know, the community led engagement. But in addition to that, we really welcome your feedback on particular topics you'd like us to cover in this way um, as an ongoing conversation, because, you know, the way to create, create momentum is to get lots of voices joining together and learning from each other. And that's the sort of space we occupy in, in the role we play. So, yeah, we're very, very open um, and just underlining what Kai and Prina have said about the fund. Um, we've got no opportunity for to support community energy and also you might have seen some announcements around Northern Power Grid supporting community resilience with a very large part of funding post storm so there will be information around that um, because obviously there's a link with, between resilience and decarbonisation so yeah we see this as an ongoing conversation so thanks to you all but also thanks to Regen for coordinating thanks Kai. Great, thanks, thanks, Helen. Yeah, as Helen mentioned, do look out for any funding opportunities for Northern Power Grid, and let us know what you want to cover at future sessions. You know, we've done this as a result of of you all telling us you you want to know more about retrofit. So let us know if you want to want to hear more about this. Um, where, where yeah, whether there's there's the specific topics within this that you'd like to know more about, or whether you want to know about um about different different topics um instead. But yeah, I mean, uh, Jonathan, was there any any final sort of thoughts thoughts from you before we wrap up? Uh, no, just like thank you to everyone for coming and participating and getting involved. Oh uh, yeah, we are. I'm really keen to learn from the session what we could do better. So please do give us negative comments as well as positive. And um, yeah, and the the work of Northern Power Grid in kind of supporting this is is really vital, I think. And and you, you the, there are kind of policy things afoot within the DNO space, and you never know there might be more ways that people like Northern Power Grid might get involved in the next two, three, four, five years. So it's a very interesting time, I think. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, do do sort of continue the conversation with us. Keep involved, you know, sign up to the mailing list we've we've talked about today, look at other resources and do join us at future sessions. Um, but yeah, I think we'll we'll wrap up there. So it's just a really big thank you to to Jonathan for for joining us today and yeah, imparting his knowledge onto us, guiding us through all of that. Um, a massive thank you to all of you for joining and for being really participative in this in this session. It only works when you sort of interact with us. But yeah, so thanks, thanks for doing that throughout this morning. Uh, really big thanks to the rest of the Regen team, Prina, George, and Hazel for helping us facilitate the sessions and and, uh, and those breakouts as well. And um, and yeah, really big thanks to, to Northern Power Grid, uh, Helen and, and Ander and the rest of the team there for, for supporting this programme of work and do look out for information on that, on that fund um, in particular as well and, and join us at future sessions as well. But I hope you've all found this morning um, interesting. I hope you can go away and, and you know start thinking about some of these schemes and how you can deliver them in your own community. If you have any more feedback for us, please, please do let us know. Um, but yeah, for now, I'll just thank you all for coming and let you go off and um, enjoy the sunshine. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. See you.